Oh my goodness, Kevin up here, I love you, man. He's talking to me in the kitchen today. I said, you better stop. Because <laughs> you can see the love. Who sees the love in Kevin's heart when he's sharing with Pastor Sharon? And then, and then he's on the verge of tears, so then that makes you want to cry. <laughs> so he did that to me in the kitchen, and now you did it to me now, so I'm, I'm a little bit messed up. <laughs> we get to live this life. I was so ramped up in my bedroom one time, and... I was reading and I was so committed. I had that militant thing on me, that surrender soldier thing on me. And I'm like, ah, and I'm talking back to the Lord and reading. And I'm committing myself. And it was like the Lord tapped me and said, hey, psst, hey. And this is the revelation. He said, every time you feel like you want to use the word responsibility, flip it into privilege. And I'm telling you, it changed everything. I get to live this way. I get to walk in love. I, I get to make peace and show mercy and live in loving kindness. It's not a duty. It's not a chore. It's not a burden. The commandments of the Lord are not burdensome. If, if you're under pressure in your Christianity, you have a wrong understanding of what you're living and what you're here for. He's, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. If you're weary, if you're heavy laden, you come unto him. You don't come unto him and then get weary and heavy laden. You're not saved by your works. You're saved by his grace. He loves you. You don't have anything to prove. You have the joy of becoming. You don't have to buckle down and try to live acceptable. You have to understand you're accepted. And if you'll take the time to believe and be accepted, your life will become acceptable. Because what you see and believe is the fruit you'll begin to bear. When you see that you're accepted in the beloved, insecurity ends. Self-consciousness is over. You're not living to be appreciated because you know you're in him. We have lived our whole lives without realizing it, even after Christ, trying to find value this way. That's why people get damaged even in church. And then we blame the people and say the people damaged us. No, it's your vulnerability. It's your wrong thinking. It's, it's deception. My, my identity isn't hinging on you. You have no ability, no possible ability of discouraging me today. Zero. <laughs> You can't break me, you can't hurt me, you can't push me back. The only thing you can do is cheer me on. Because I did not wake up today for you to love me. I woke up to be more like him. So this day it's already a win-win. <laughs> Yay. Do you get it? Come on, we've been deceived. We, we prayed a prayer to go to heaven. We've tried to commit ourselves and serve in the church and stay faithful that way. But we might have missed the point that your life is complete in Him. You don't need to prove nothing. You have the joy of becoming something. You're not on eggshells. You're not carrying a heavy weight. You're in the privilege of grace and God's power and God's ability on your behalf. I wonder if you would bring that perspective into your marriage. I wonder if you'd bring that perspective into your job. You'd never be mad at your boss again. You'd cry for him. You'd never look for another job. You'd pray for the redemption of the place you work. You'd never drive home mad and miserable, and you'd never go home and spew your complaint on your family. You'd never bear the brunt of a struggle day. You'd actually walk in the joy of knowing him. Wouldn't it be amazing? To not need another job because you can't stand where you work because of the people. And instead have compassion on the people because you realize, forgive them, Father. They don't have a clue who they are and I'm supposed to know who I am. I'm a Christian. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not being mean. I'm trying to cheer you on. It's Sunday morning. Do you know why we're here? It's not because you go to the current and you're a Christian. It's to stir one another in love and good works so we stay effectual and stay impacting in our community. Because yes. if you take a church out of the community and the community doesn't even know you're gone, what were we doing? Oh 
Most churches could disappear right now and nobody know they weren't meeting anymore. If your church disappears, Pastor Kevin, and nobody would notice, which I know better because you guys are on a roll and God's building this thing and I'm excited about it. I'm perceiving things the whole time I'm here. I'm excited. But if this church would just dry up and disappear and you would call off your meetings and nobody gathered at the current anymore and nobody would notice that this church ain't here, what were we doing? Listen, people, forgive me, I'm intense right now. We're not here to survive. We're not Christians to make it. We're already in. We already won. We're never going to die. We're never going to be judged for our sins. The Spirit of God lives in us. Watch. And nobody owes us a thing, and we owe no man anything but to love the way we've been loved. And you think I believe that? I'm going to have a bad attitude? And I feel, well, they shouldn't have. Well, that hurt. Well, I don't know why people. Well, you know, that's what I hate about people. No, no, no. Not today, friend. Tomorrow ain't going to be a good day for that either. For the rest of my life, I've been changed. I don't know how to have tension with my wife. And I'm not judging you. And don't elbow your spouse. Because if you do, I'm talking to you. I don't know how to have tension in my home. I'm made for peace. I'm not living for me. I didn't wake up for me. And that's the key I want to talk to you about this morning. There's no other way to be a Christian than to wake up and live for Christ. Your life is not your own. You have been bought with a price. That doesn't make you a slave in the sense of slavery. It makes you one with God. When you see the word slave in Romans 6, you know what it means? Bound and chained to do one's will. You're a slave to God. You're bound and chained to Him through the blood of Jesus to do His will. Why? Because it's why He made man. Bear with me this morning. I want to stir you in love and good works. I don't want you to even believe that discouragement is viable and, and, and justifiable. I don't want you to believe that unforgiveness is even thinkable. Sometimes Christians say, well, t- give me time. It takes time trying to get them to forgive. And they say, well, just back off and give me time. Some of these things take time. You ask Jesus if that's true. You only learned that from you and others. You didn't learn that from him. Takes time to forgive? Why do we have a grid for unforgiveness? Because we weren't saved when we were born. We were born outside of God. Now we're born again. We shouldn't even have a grid for unforgiveness. Why? Because he's forgiven us of everything we've ever done. We owed him a debt we could never pay. And he removed it from us. And then we're going to go out like Matthew 18 and hold our brother accountable for the thing he did when we're forgiven of everything we did. He called that an evil and wicked servant, not pagan, servant in the house. Unforgiveness shouldn't be so relevant. We should be like, what? How can I not forgive? I've been forgiven of everything. I ask the Lord, why do we struggle with unforgiveness so much? See, because what I do... I'm aware of it because of what I do. I'm aware how alive it is because of what I do. And I'm asking him this question. You know what the Lord spoke to my heart? He said, I said, why do people have such a hard time forgiving? He said, because they've never realized how forgiven they are. And they've never stepped in the beauty and the joy of forgiveness and being clean. Completely clean in my sight. Because if you ever realize you've been forgiven, truly forgiven, he remembers your lawless deeds no more and clean of everything you've ever done, you won't even think of holding a man accountable for the thing he's done. You will want to afford him the same loving, merciful heart that came and saved you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Watch. 
Anything else would be solely, completely self-centered. You want something you're not willing to become. This isn't a hard message. It's life-giving. Because if you're not living this way, you're not having fun. You're moved by everything but him. <laughs> Come on, I got you now. You're here. They gave me the mic. Stone Pastor Kevin. <laughs> you realize every service we stone somebody. But it's not me because it's not my fault. <laughs> I'm just being fun loving. Bible says in the beginning that God made man for his image. The image was lost through sin because the day Adam ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the day he died, but he didn't fall over dead. So if he died, but he didn't fall over dead, what died? We all say his spirit. The image died. He got separated from the source of love and became in need of love. So instead of being love, now he needs love. And he ain't looking for love this way because he's separated. He's not on the earth to need love. He's one with God. He's made for God's image. God is love. God made man for his image. If we've become a Christian for any other reason, then we're not even on the earth for why we're here. You don't put metal in a microwave. It doesn't work. It's not made for metal. You don't live for yourself. It doesn't work. You're not made for you. You're made for him. His glory, his great name. You read the manufacturer's handbook. If you put metal in the microwave, it ain't good. You read the manufacturer's handbook. You live for yourself and it ain't good. And you know what I've found? Without realizing it. I'm not talking to evil people this morning. I'm not talking to hypocrites. I'm talking to his children. You didn't wake up to try to figure out how to sin and get away with it. I'm not correcting you. I'm talking that we don't understand some of these things. I'm talking to sincere people this morning. I know it. In fact, there's not as many hypocrites in the room as people think. It's usually people that are misunderstanding things. Trying too hard because they care. That's usually the people I'm talking to. God made us for his image. If you get saved for any other reason, you're not going to run well. You don't just get saved to go to heaven. You don't just get saved because your marriage is in trouble. You don't just get saved because you found out your terminal. You don't just get saved because you just lost your job and wrecked your car. That'll keep self-centeredness alive. You don't get saved for you. You get saved to get back to why you're here in the first place so you can walk out his will and purpose. You get saved to get rid of your image so you can take on his. So that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead can come and dwell in you. So that you can actually deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. What an amazing thing. The Bible says in Philippians 2, have this mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. You're telling me you're going to let me into the inner motive of Jesus and his mind and what made him tick and took him to the cross without fail and complaint. And you're telling me I can have that same mind? I want that. Because the mind I had before wasn't looking like him. You're telling me in Ephesians 5.1 that I can walk in love just as, not somewhat like, just as Jesus loved? And we all grew up in religion that says, well, that was Jesus. Yeah, but that was Jesus. And when I read my Bible, it's saying, follow him. The same spirit that raises from the dead is in you. And if you believe in him, the things he did, you'll do in greater things. Because I go to my father. Now see, you can't talk me out of that with religion. You can't say, yeah, but. You're way too late. Yeah, but don't work. 
And I'm not letting anyone take their experience and raise it above the truth and the grace of God that's available through a crucified Jesus. Are you hearing me this morning? Not because I'm talking high volume. Are you hearing me this morning? This is a great privilege. It's, it's, we should be done with needing each other so bad that our dispositions hanging in the balance and we're mad or we're moody or whatever. You're just boasting without knowing it and not knowing him like you could. The Lord told me a long time ago, anger is a charismatic worship service of the wrong deity. People flail their arms. Holy hush, church. You know how it was in, in seasons in, in our lives and times past? Shh. Children, shh. Can't you let the kids laugh and play? Go to shh. No wonder the kids didn't want to go to church. Shh. Why are you blinking? But then somebody pulls out in front of you. And for 10 minutes, can you believe it? I don't know how people even get their license. Charismatic worship service of the wrong God. Manifesting the wrong image. The mark of the beast. Everybody's in fretting over revelations and scared of the end times. Just live Christ and you don't even have to think about anything. Just live Christ. The mark of the beast. Just getting a new name, being marked by God. What's all that need? Wonder if it's just nature. Wonder if 666 really is the number of man, meaning carnal and flesh. Wonder if you don't get a stamp on your forehead. Wonder if your forehead represents your soul. And what comes out of a man is what's in a man. Wonder if 666 is just the nature of man instead of the nature of God. Wonder if it's carnal instead of life in the spirit. Wonder if it's the nature of the devil instead of the nature of Jesus. Wonder if that's the mark. Wonder if every man's marked by what he reveals and expresses from the inside. Out of your mouth comes your heart. You know a man by his fruits. Doesn't matter if you go to church for 50 years. If you don't look like Jesus, you're no different than the man that never went to church. Let's get real and not be deceived and soft pedal this thing. We just talked about funerals. I said, isn't it crazy? Then we go to a funeral and we feel like we have to lie to make it rosy. Everybody knows the guy didn't live Jesus. But we remember the day he prayed that sinner's prayer. And that's all we talk about the whole funeral. I ain't lying at nobody's funeral, man. And I ain't nobody's judge, and I ain't going to say whether they're in heaven or hell, but I ain't lying at nobody's funeral. You want to live in a way that when you're laying there, people are weeping and want to live what they saw in you. And that people are honored that they knew you. And that you have a legacy and a resume of lives that have been touched by the way you lived. You don't want to have no preacher have to come and say something rosy to cover space and time. Because we're standing there unsure because you were a little mean at times. And you had your moments. <laughs> Come on, man. You got one shot. Come on. I'm a preacher. This is Sunday morning. You got one shot. It's called life. A little window. Here today. Gone tomorrow. Wisp in a vapor. Some of you are 30 and don't know how it happened. Some of you are 50 and freaked out. Some of you are 70 telling stories 45 years ago that feel like yesterday. Time is skating, and you can't even relate to 70 years, but you know it came and went. And when you look on the calendar, you're 70, but you can't relate to 70. Who knows I'm telling the truth? I'm 61. I don't even know what happened. You're 12, and you can't wait till you're 16. You're 16. You can't wait till you're 18, adult. You're 18. You can't wait for 21 for the wrong reason. And now there's no more goals. Now you're 25 and freaking out. Now you're 30. Ah! Now you're 35 looking in all the mirrors. Now you're 40. You don't even want a mirror. You know I'm telling the truth. You can't wait to grow up. And then there's no goals. 
But the whole time there was a goal. To be one with him and manifest him. To walk in the light as he's in the light. To let your light. Not live off of someone else's. Let your light so shine before men. That they see your life. Faith says, Amen. Flesh says, Amen. Flesh agrees but doesn't respond. Faith agrees and responds. I said a long time ago, Pastor, if I'm going to teach in front of people like this, please do one thing for me, Lord. When I'm finished, Make it possible that a man only has one of two responses. That he says, man, I hear what you're saying, pastor, and I want it. Or I hear what you're saying, I just don't want it. But please don't let anybody leave and say, what's he trying to say? There ain't nobody sitting here confused right now. I wonder what he's trying to get at. You know that would be the love of God to preach this way? Because he wants to give your heart that opportunity. Because when there's deception, you don't know what to do. But when it's crystal clear, it locates your want to. And that's why there's a judgment. Because every man has an opportunity to decide in his lifetime. The love of God makes sure of it. And in the end, there'll be nobody getting ripped off. By an unrighteous court. Because he is a just and righteous God. Paul said no man has an excuse. I don't care how blatantly atheistic people claim to be. They've had second guesses in their heart. They've had second thoughts in their mind. They've had the opportunity to make change all along the way. God's love sees to it. Are you with me? We get to live this way. God made man for his image. Don't miss this. That means man's on the earth with intention. If we miss the intention, we won't walk in the grace that empowers the intention. And that's why life feels tough. Peter said, don't think it's strange. Your friends all over the earth are going through the same things you are. Don't think it's strange. Everybody has challenges, circumstances, stuff. We all have to taxi through life. Ephesians says we all bear our own heavy loads. But his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. You're not on the earth for your circumstances to go better. You're on the earth to look like him in the middle of your circumstances. Most people are tricked into all they do. It's self-focused, self-conscious, self-centered. All they do. Praying over every circumstance. Everything's a spirit. Everything's out to get them. And it's like they're in this spiritual video game trying to get through the day unscathed. Come on, I've watched it as a pastor. And I'm like, what are we doing? It's not about you. It's about him in you. Are you with me? We think faith is just for favor and first place at the register and the best parking and green lights the whole way through town, spiritual, shaka da da See what you're not even realizing when your light's green, somebody's red. Why don't you care? We're supposed to prefer one another, not desire our own interests, but the interests of others. When you've got the best parking place, somebody else doesn't. You call that favor. It might be selfish. <laughs> amen, Pastor. That's amen. Amen. I just needed one good strong amen on that one. Look, I'm here to stir you. If this church would vanish, would this community realize it? 
I know there's a whole group of homeless folks that would. I know there's other folks that would. We want to make sure that if you weren't here, you individually weren't here, people would miss that. But better yet, people would have something that you carry because you imparted it. That's what your legacy should look like. People living something they're living because they knew you. Who started this? Jesus. What are we called? Christian, what's it mean? Church attendance? You say, hey, are you a Christian? Oh yeah, I go to church. That's exactly what people say. And you say, awesome, where do you go? Oh, over here, well, how are you doing? Well, two biggest challenges, get a tear in their eye and say, keep me in prayer. That's a normal conversation in church. I have a friend, a dear friend of mine says, I don't even ask Christians how they're doing anymore because they tell you. And he said, it's always their trouble, their trial, their struggle, and keep me in prayer. It's never Christ in them, how they're overcoming through faith, how they're manifesting Christ in the middle of their trial, how they're counting all things joy and glorying in their tribulation. Not afraid of death, calamity, diagnosis, symptoms, living fearless because they're dead for his name. Come on, it's all scriptural. It's not radical. It's just always been Christianity. It's gotten to the point, Pastor, when you preach it, it sounds extreme. That's the snare of the devil. That's the tactic of the enemy. To make Christianity sound so radical to us that maybe only a few are even thinking about it and they're just different. When it's what every one of us is called to. You're all called to love. You're all called to make peace. You're not called to animosity. It's not normal. It's not in heaven. It's not normal. You're not called to unforgiveness. It's not normal. Let's stop selling cheap. We're not for sale. We've been bought with a price. Well, yeah, but everybody does that. Everybody, you can't tell me well, you're in denial. Well, you're taking, talking high-minded, brother. You got to keep it real and relate. I'm preaching heaven on earth. That's as real as it gets. What you want me to relate with the weakness, so we stay weak without conviction? You want me to just say, yeah, I know we all have our own blow-ups with our own spouses, and if we say we don't, we're lying. I was in the service once, and pastor, pastor got up and said, hey, I know it's been a, a real week for everybody. How many of you been angry this week? People raising their hands everywhere. And I'm like, what is going on right now? And he said, well, if you didn't raise your hand, we have an order call for all the liars at the end of the service. <laughs> what the pastor's saying is everybody's going to be angry. Face it. My Bible says put off anger. You yourselves are to put it off, not manage it. Who knows there's anger management out there? Now, I'm not bashing nobody, but watch this. Anger management should be hypocrisy to the Christian. In other words, I'm angry. I'm just mature enough to handle it and not express it. So I'm angry with you, Kevin. I haven't talked to you about it. I'm so mature. I'm just harboring it in my heart without expression. It can be around you and you don't even know it. Because I'm so mature. I am managing my anger. Uh -huh. I want it to sound twisted so you never buy into it. You put it off. Can we look at something? Would you mind? I got a little bit of time. I won't hold you late. I don't get scared. Your kids will be fine. Your roast ain't going to burn. You probably ain't got a roast in in this time of the year anyway. Do you? going to fire up that grill though, ain't you? No, we won't be here long. I, I never blow up Sundays. I don't need to be here long. Open services, night services, I don't think much about time, but I, I pastored. I handle Sundays very well. But we got to look at this. So where have we been so far? Colossians 3, go there. We'll read it at some point. <laughs> God made man for his image. Let us, who knows that's Genesis 126, let us make man in, in our image. Verse 27, so in the image of God, he made us both male and, oh, you ought to like this, ladies, both male and who? Amen. 
in his own image and his likeness. What's the number one identity, destiny, call, and purpose of a man? To be found in the image of God. What's the number one call and purpose and identity of a woman? To be found in the image of God. Women, I'm just here to tell you, I don't have time to hash all this out, and I'll probably stir a lot of bees and bugs and internet critics and all that stuff. But you are no less than us. You have the same exact value, women. God loves you, values you. You are not under our feet. You aren't here to serve us. You're here to walk beside us and manifest Christ. And you have no idea how much I actually respect and honor women. And I wish the men would walk out Christ half as well as I've seen women. You aren't lacking anything. You are not less than a man. You all have the ability and honor and your creative value to walk out Christ. You can all walk in love and you can all live by the Spirit. And yes, you have a voice and yes, you can walk in giftings. Amen? amen. Well, you don't even have to say amen. I'm saying amen because I believe it. And I can show you that through and through in the Word. The image got lost through sin. And God and man were separated. Man got separated from God, the source of life and the source of love. And he said, the day you eat the tree is the day you surely die. That means something's going to die. It sounds like him. You surely die. The day you surely die. He's not talking about his physical temple. He's talking about who he is. Because when he ate the tree and he gets separated from God, the image is lost and love is lost. And man changes dramatically. He doesn't just sin he takes on the nature of the enemy of God and he's separated from his father. What's the nature of the enemy of God? Self-centered, boastful, proud, angry, arrogant. Isn't that everything we've all been without trying? Did anybody have to study a course to master anger? Did anybody stay up late and read to get a 4.0 in anger? Or, or was it already there when you had the binky in your mouth and mom took it out and you still wanted it? Yeah! <laughs> e lollipop! Honey, no. <laughs> I love children. But you can't tell me God did that. <laughs> Come on, it's in the nature. It's the fall of man. It's separate from God. And that little baby, as precious as it is, needs born again someday. <laughs> so instead of you getting influenced by the baby and at wit's end and hair frazzled and condemned and thinking you're a failure parent, maybe you ought to just recognize my child's going to need Jesus, so I'm going to manifest him well. <laughs> and when my child gets older, they're going to see Jesus in me and one who I am because I'm in him and he's in me. Yeah. And then they're seven years old in their bed and say, Mommy... You're so different than me. What do you mean, honey? Well, and they start sharing their seven-year-old little explanation in heart. And you're melting and you're going, oh my God. Honey, what you're talking about is Jesus. He lives in me. I've yielded my life to him. No, that's why I don't fuss you like you see other people getting fussed. That's why I don't. Honey, I love you. It's not that you do everything right, but you're more than the things you do. And you can be so much more. And that's what I always see, honey. Mommy, I love you. When I grow up, I want to be just like you. Well, there's only one way you can do that, honey. Accept Jesus like I did, and his spirit will come into you. Don't live for yourself. You know when you pout and fuss, what are you really doing? Now there's seven. You can talk straight. You say, yeah, that's you thinking for you and yourself, and me, myself, and I, and I want. Well, I don't want. And now they're giggling, and you're saying, see, you know what I mean. Yeah. Listen, let's just get saved. Now you're leading your little daughter to Jesus because she sees him in your life. That sure beats being condemned because you're failing as a parent because your child's freaking out all the time. <laughs> the whole purpose we're on the earth is the image of God. The image got lost through sin, so God took care of sin through Jesus. Shed his holy blood to wash us clean. And what was red as scarlet, our sins, has been washed white as snow. And if you believe the gospel and you're sincere and repented, you are forgiven of every sin you've ever committed 
And you are absolutely acquitted, justified, and clean in the sight of God. Colossians puts it this way, and it's not my sermon. Holy, blameless, and above reproach in His sight. Now, I would love to challenge you this morning. How many of you wake up and actually think about being holy and blameless and above reproach in the sight of God? How many of you actually wake up in the morning and appreciate that you're forgiven of everything you've ever done and you are clean through the blood of Jesus Christ, accepted in Him, and you've got nothing to prove, just the joy of becoming? How many of you go to work and just think about nobody owes me a thing and I have this job and I see it as a mission and what an opportunity to manifest Christ without striving or pressure. I'm just going to live who I am and they're going to see you because you're in me and I'm in you. That sure beats God. I really need your grace today. I got a tough job and a lot on my plate. God, if you don't pull through, I'll never make it to the end. And God, I had days like this before and I just, man, I need you today like to help me get through these meetings and help me. And we think that's just cool prayer in Christianity. Are you with me? Instead of, Father, what an honor that you live in me today. And man, I know my schedule's tight and I got all these meetings, but I am so excited of how you're going to show up and move. And even when so-and-so comes across the way he does, I thank you, God, that you have put such a compassion in my heart for him. If he knew who he was, he would never have that attitude. Forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. God, would you love him through me today? What an honor. For that would change your day. It would change theirs too. Are you all with me? Yes. You're not going to do that if you're self-centered. Self-centered is very subtle. It's not usually gross and apparent. It's very sneaky because we were self-centered from the time we can remember. From the time you can remember, from the youngest in this room to the oldest, pay attention. You know this is true. From the time you can remember... You were self-conscious, you needed valued, you needed support, you needed appreciated, you needed to feel protected, you needed loved, you needed a lot of things, you and I, and we didn't get most of the things we needed. And it created insecurity, it formed our disposition, it formed our personalities, and whatever we become is a product of however we respond, however it went down. But the truth is, no matter how you respond, none of it's the real you, it's all a lie. And then we take personality tests and say, well, I'm this way and I'm this personality and I'm this and I'm this. No, you were fashioned that way by the wrong potter. It has nothing to do with you. Well, I've always been, well, who are you in Christ? Well, I've always been, no, you were molded that way through life, not through him. That's why you put off the old and put on the new. That's why you have new life through Jesus Christ. That's why you become a new wineskin so you contain the new wine. Come on, we've reduced it to a prayer that saves me and sends me to heaven when I die. And then stay faithful in a word preaching church. That's about what we've reduced it to, people. Instead of Christ in me, the hope of glory. You know what love does, Jennifer? You know what love does? It lays down its life for another. Look at the perversion. Let's flip the coin. You know what the opposite of love does? lives at the expense of another. We've all done it. You can be in a family of four, cop an attitude, put pressure on the other three. You're not giving life, you're stealing it, you're taking it, you're demanding something for you. You just give your spouse the silent treatment, you're proving you go to church, you just don't know Jesus like you could. And you're living at the expense of your spouse, putting the pressure on their emotions, forcing a response out of them. Come on! Love lays down its life for another. And we've all been tricked into living at the expense of one another. Well, I don't appreciate what they said. Well, they said, enough. well, I ain't loving them. I ain't forgiving them. I'm not enabling them. I'm not going to allow them to stay in their sin. They need some tough love. But the whole time you're saying it, you're angry, ticked off, and frustrated. Well, somebody's got to hold them accountable. It's not you, friend. Take a breath and back off and be more like Jesus. Because when you love them, you'll have a voice in their life. When you care about them, you'll have a voice. When you're just mad, you better keep it. You'll cause more trouble than good. Don't even correct your children because you're frustrated. Correct your children because they're more than what they're doing. 
Not because they crossed your line. Get rid of your line. Are you with me? I know I'm throwing a lot at you. It's just the way it's coming. I'm not really apologizing for it. I'm just saying, he buckled your belts. Just hang in there. We're not going to crash. I'm going to read this and I got to be done then. What time's your normal time? 11.30, 11.45, something like that. No, no, don't lie to me, Pastor. You lie, you fry. I read it. In my... <laughs> About what time? 11.40, 11.30, 11.30-ish. I'm going to get you out of here. You're going to be stirred up. And you know what's going to happen? Your heart's going to be faced with, do I want to or don't I want to? So we set you all up today. We got you here and put conviction in your soul. And now you'll have to deal with it. <laughs> and it'll save you and rescue you. And, and three weeks from now, you might be venting on somebody. You just might be venting on somebody. And as soon as you're venting, you might see my face. And go, ah, it's him. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, those words just might come to convict you and give you a chance to do different. Forgive them, Father, they don't know what they do. But now that the truth's come, we have options. And it's the truth that makes us free. And that wonderful Holy Spirit in the middle of your life will bring these things to your remembrance and give you a chance to step into Him. The Lord told me a long time ago, Dan, I don't want you living Crossroads Christianity. I said, I don't know if I've ever heard that sermon. I said, what is that? He said, to where you always have options and choices to make. Like Dorothy trying to find the, the Emerald City and which way do I go in the Scarecrow. He said, I don't want you living options. Stop, look, listen. He said, I want you on that narrow road called the way. And I said, wow, I think I get that. He did that for me a long time ago. It's why I'm so intense. It's why I'm so passionate. Because I've got 28 years of living this thing under my belt. This is not a theology to me. I am not here to preach my precepts and my belief system. I'm here to talk about what I've lived for 28 years. And that it's powerful and it's amazing. And it'll take you through anything and everything this life will ever throw at you. My hair. Do you see the color of my hair? Of course I've lost loved ones. Of course I've had friends die. Of course I've had major challenges just like you. But do you see any of that in me? You're not supposed to. Because none of those things have a thing to do with who I am. You can't tell my mother died of sickness. You can't tell my dad was an alcoholic and never said I love you. You can't tell my brother just died unexpected a year and a half ago. You can't tell I was touched strong at a young age. You can't tell my child ran off and did drugs. You can't tell my wife was in a coma on life support. You can't see none of that. And I'll tell you what you don't see. Me wondering who God is and is he for me and am I saved and why am I going through all this? And what door did I open? And I wonder why. You don't see that, do you? <laughs> Yahoo! I'm going to read this or I'm going to mess up. Because I love you so much, I gave you all that time to find Colossians 3. If you didn't find it yet, we'll pray for you at the end. No, I'm kidding. That word if, in chapter 3, verse 1 of Colossians, it's a little Greek word that means since. He's not challenging you and saying, if you're really saved, do this, or if you're really saved, do that. That's how we hear sometimes. It's a little Greek word. It says, since you're saved. Watch. Can I just read? I'm just going to read and try not to preach too much. I, I have time, though. Since you were all raised with Christ... Seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. This is admonishment, people. This is Christian conduct. This is things we ought to live now that we're saved. Who understands and agrees with what I'm saying? 
I have the color purple in my Bible. It's Christian conduct. It's commandments. It's things we're all to live. What predominant color do you see in my Bible? When I color my Bibles, I go through three purple, four purple pens just to do the New Testament. It's the color I use the most. The most scripture is Christian conduct and how we're to live now that we're saved. It must be important. If that whole, all that purple, you see that green? That's the love of God. You see the orange? That's promises. You see the purple above the promises? That's what I walk in to receive the promise. My Bible's awesome. Don't you steal it. Somebody said, you ought to get them printed and get them. I said, no, get your own pens and do your own and have fun in the Holy Ghost. They email me, what's your color code? Come up with your own. Stop it. <laughs> My color code. I'm Dan Moeller. I'm all over YouTube. It might be more anointed than yours. Stop it. People do that to me. I don't like it. Since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Uh-oh. Set your mind on things above, not the things of the earth, for you die. See, you did not pray a prayer to go to heaven. You died. That's why we get water baptized. We die to live. What do we die? To ourselves everything we've ever done and everything ever done to us. Now we don't even have a story anymore. We have him and his story. We don't look back. We put our hand to the plow. We don't have a past. We have a present and things to come. We have new life through Jesus Christ. It never fails. You preach like this. You preach on purity. You preach on forgiveness. You preach on righteousness. You preach on faith. And somebody comes to you and says, Brother, that all's great and I'm glad it works for you. But you just don't know what it's been like and what I've been through growing up. You don't know my story. And they're 50 years old talking like that. It never fails. It happens a lot. And I'm like, what does that have anything to do with what I'm talking about? What it was like when you were growing up when you're 50. You're 50 still talking about your childhood. And you're saved 30 years. So now you're going to be 70, saved 50 years, and still dictated by how it was when you were 8. Come on, that can't sound cool. Come on, I'm not being insensitive. I know it's been tough. A lot of us have been through hell. But so is he. To get us out. And if we're going to stay there and identify there and only talk about there and not grow up into Him and all things, then what are we doing? What are we even believing? I am not the man I used to be. I'm not what was done to me. I'm what was done for me. I'm not going to let what one man said trump what one man said. I'm not going to let what one man did trump what one man did. I'm going to let Him be Lord and not my past. Come on, follow with me and let's go after Christ. I'm going to set my mind on things above. Why? Because I died, you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Where Christ, uh, uh, Christ in God, when Christ who is our life appears, then you will appear with Him in glory. Woo! Therefore, because this is true, put to death, not balance, not find a healthy place of... Kill it! As you know it, put it to death. Your members which are on the earth. It's amazing. Every flesh list, the first thing is sexuality. Why? It's ruled by sensuality and emotions. And there's not one topic on the planet that's exploited more than sexuality. There's not even a close second. And everybody's been touched by it at a very young age. The exploitation of sexuality. He said, put it to death as you know it. Ain't that something? That means the whole time it's been perverted and godless. That means there's a different motive. There's a different way and it's called the. And we've all been touched by this thing. And he's saying, now that you've been touched by him, recognize none of this that you've known has nothing to do with what he designed, who he is, and what he created you for. 
Every Christian book on sexuality I've ever glanced at is bringing the world into us and wrapping Christian language around the world. It's not a different motive, a different reason, a different heart. It's not spiritual. It's not hoopa, Holy Spirit over the union. It's not one man and one woman and one person for life. It's sleep around many partners, feeling restless. Go try to hook up. Score. Be real with me. It's a holy and sacred and amazing thing. Sexuality and covenant. You got the woman. We learn this stuff in school. Don't get uncomfortable. We should talk about this in church. You got the woman with a hymen in her body as a little newborn baby. Why is that there? Why would God? Do you believe God made people? Do you believe he did things for reasons or did things just happenstance? They have a hymen. It's there their whole life and until it's broken through intercourse. So they have the hymen and it's what reveals you're a virgin. And why is it there? It's so that on the night of consummation and wedding and marriage and covenant, the man breaks that veil of flesh and passes through the veil into the inner courts of the woman. There's blood in the hymen, blood in the semen. They cut blood covenant and forever are one in the sight of God. We've turned that into one night stands, masturbation, fantasies. I don't know how I got on all this. You put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness. It's all idolatry. And because of these things, the wrath of God is coming to the sons that continually disobey. In which you yourselves once walked when you believed or lived that way. See, that's what keeps us humble. You're not holier than thou. You don't look down on people. You understand we were all rescued from the same pit. And now that you're rescued, you want to get as many out of that pit as you can. You don't turn your nose up at them and say, I can't believe they're living that way. You say, forgive them, Father. They don't know who they are and what they're doing. But now, but now, verse 8, you yourselves are to put off these things, anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Don't lie to one another. Why? Because you've put off the old man with his deeds and you've put on a new man. Who's the new man? He's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. We don't preach that gospel. We preach if you die tonight and don't know where you're going, pray this prayer so you can be sure. We preach assurance, not transformation. Baptism has slipped out of the body of Christ at large. It's not even mentioned most of the time. In the book of Acts, they never even had an order call without baptism being the heart of the message. Why? They weren't trying to get men to heaven in those days. They were trying to get heaven back into men. If you've never been water baptized, please get water baptized. Go all the way under and call everything you've ever been, been dead and let it die with Christ. So when you raise, you come up believing in the newness of life. Let it be the womb of God. That's how a baby's born. The water breaks and out comes the baby. That's how we know we better get in the car. Come on, this isn't an accident. Natural, spiritual. The womb of God, the baby goes into the water in the womb of water. The water breaks, out comes a brand new baby, new birth, newborn. Holy Spirit midwife hovering over the water, presented to Father, look, a brand new baby boy, ain't he awesome? Water baptism almost slipped away in most churches, annual at best. Look at verse 12, therefore... As the elect of God, holy and beloved, what we put off in verse 10 or verse 9, the old man and his deeds, what we put on in verse 10, the new man renewed in knowledge according to what? Oh, you got it. You've put on the new man renewed in knowledge according to what? Why is that there? Because that's why man was made. What was lost through sin? The image. What did Jesus pay the price to put back on us? 
Do you know he was beat beyond description? That he was marred more than any of his sons of men? Do you catch this stuff in your Bible? Do you understand that they beat him again and again and again and again and again till he was so beaten you couldn't tell who he was? Because if he was marred more than any of the sons of men when they were done with him, there's no way he was recognizable. They burned people on crosses and stakes all the time. They boiled people in oil. Are you telling me when they burn you and soak you in oil and burn you on a stake that when the fire ceases you're going to tell if that was Freddie, Johnny, or Mary? He was marred more than anyone was ever marred. That means he was rendered unrecognizable. Why? Because when sin got done with Adam, he didn't look anything like he was created to be. The image was lost. So Jesus gave up his image and his appearance to pay the price, to parallel and pay the price for us to get the image back. Come on, it's real. Here's the image. Because we put off, now we're putting on. Put on. Would you close your eyes with me and I'll close with this. And I'm going to step down, Pastor, and then you come on up and close your congregation out, okay? You come up and close them out. But I'm, I'm just teaching you this morning. I'm not minister. We're not doing an oracle. If he wants to, he can. He's the man of this house. But this is what I'm supposed to do. Close your eyes with me. And let this be your sincere heart and your sincere prayer, please. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. Put on kindness. Put on humility and meekness. And long suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also forgive. But above all these things, put on love. For love is the bond of perfection. Father, I thank you. You found a house that is willing to live this message. I believe that. I don't believe I preached any of these three messages because I'm correcting these people. I believe you found a people that say, I want to live this way. And I'm asking for grace in this house that we would stay convicted, stay sharp, and stay fresh in the truth that not one person in this room would ever be found weary and well-doing. That, Lord God, you would touch your people with power today through the truth of your purpose. And let us run well and finish well, walking in the light as you, King Jesus, are the light. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Can you just stand at your feet? Come on, give the Lord a big round of applause. Come on. Let's give him some praise. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, listen. I know this is just going to marinate in your spirit for the next few days, the next few weeks. And I just thank God for that. Praise team's coming up. Can we just... Listen, it's just 11.30. Can we just, maybe for just five minutes. We're not going to have a formal closing. If you need to go ahead and sneak out, go ahead and sneak out. I love you and I thank you for coming. But can we just maybe take just about five minutes, just maybe about five minutes or however long, and just, can we just give God thanks? This praise team comes and just ministers in music. Can we just thank the Lord? Can we just thank Him for His Word, His truth, His presence? What he's doing in us. Can we just can we just think? He's so good. I just sat down here as he ministered to us today and I just wept. I thought, man, man, how good God is. He's so good. I just can't get over it. He's just so good. Hadn't he been good to us? Can you just lift your hands to heaven with me?